Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's Wednesday, January 10 of a brand new year, 2018, and here we are at episode 17. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as usual, the man in Brooklyn himself, I'm joined by Mr. Chad Owen. Welcome to 2018, Mike. I know. It's already hot and steamy in Sydney. How is your 2018, Chad? Yeah, well, while you're having record highs in uh, Sydney, it's uh, been quite cold here. But so far, I think uh, productivity has been high in 2018. I've kept to my intentions, so uh, I'm pretty happy so far. Nice. I like it. That sounds very, very good. And we need to warm you up there on the east coast of the USA. How are we going to kick off 2018? Who are we going to focus on in this show, Chad? We are continuing our profile of investors in, in Silicon Valley and, and across the globe who are whose job it is to find the best innovators out there and to invest in them. And so today we're tackling the dynamic duo of uh, Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen of Andreessen Horowitz. And um, they're kind of the name in venture capital in Silicon Valley, wouldn't you say? Oh, um, yeah, I think that uh, apart from the fact that they've invested these two, Airbnb, Facebook, BuzzFeed, GitHub, Magic Leap, Lyft, Oculus, Pinterest, Skype, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What's also very powerful as a combination, these two guys are, are amazing. Mark Andreessen was the founder of Netscape, which was in history will be one of the most instrumental companies in the world of the internet. And on the other side, Ben Horowitz, who worked a lot with Mark throughout his career prior to starting their own VC firm, he is a fantastic uh, thinker around business and entrepreneurship, and he loves to give it very frank and honest view. And he speaks to the truth of just how hard uh, starting a company is. And he has a very popular book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. So they're quite a combination. Mark Andreessen is this fast-talking super geek. Ben Horowitz is this sort of entrepreneurial, hip-hop, rap-loving, uh, anecdote storyteller. So we're in for quite a ride today. Yeah, I, I don't know of any other headline partners at a VC firm that have both you know, founded and, and sold such successful companies. And I think that their trials and tribulations as founders themselves is one thing that has set them apart in the VC community. And um, many of the clips that we're going to share with you on the show today will kind of help explain how that that history has, you know, influenced their philosophy and how they they choose to invest. Yes, I, I think their their advantage is as investors that they have traveled the the hero's journey of starting companies prior to doing that. So I think they're very empathetic towards founders. I think they understand the business at both a macro and micro scale. I think we're in for quite a treat, whether, we, whether we're talking about entrepreneurship, talent, and getting the best out of people, or really how to innovate. It's all in front of us for this show. So I, I'm really excited to get into some of this stuff. Yeah, and this this first clip we have is really just the two of them in their own words, uh, explaining a little bit why they decided to start their own fund together. We saw the opportunity to create the venture capital firm that we would have wanted to take money from had it existed. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of the classic case of we were a customer of venture capital for 15 years. So while we hadn't been VCs, we had a very good idea of what it was like to be on the other side of the table and to actually be the consumer of the product, if you will. Founders make the best CEOs. And that was like at the time, like real counter programming and that we had looked at all the really great companies and they were typically run by their founders. Uh, and we really believe there was a reason for that. Having been entrepreneurs that the founder has the knowledge, they've got the commitment, they've got the passion. Um, that's very hard to implant into the company. And then we designed the firm rather than being a firm for a, uh, to replace a founder with a professional CEO. We became the firm to teach the founder how to be the CEO mm -hmm. and enable the founder to be the CEO. 
So what's really interesting is what they are embodying our good friend Richard Branson. They, they were turning frustrations that they had on the, as customers of VCs. They, they channeled that in order to, to create their, their company. And I think that's, it's such a simple technique in innovating that we can all learn from, like the things that bother you. I mean, they spent, as they said, over a decade being a customer of venture capitalists. And they're like, there's a ton we can do here. Yeah, th- I think there was like a history of 30 years of venture capital, at least in Silicon Valley, you know, with three or four top players. And there was a kind of tried and true old boys network of how you got the money and how that money was dispersed mm-hmm. and kind of what you were held accountable to as a founder. And they came up in the software and in the internet days. And, you know, they're just like, we don't want to do it the way it was done before. We had trouble when we were, you know, running Netscape and and Opsware. So we're actually just going to create the VC company that we wish existed. And um, I I, I think that's, uh, you're exactly right. And it's hearkening back to Richard and just, you know, build a company around your frustrations and and you can do very well. Yeah, and and what they talked about there and what the, what actually uh, Ben Horowitz talks about in this next clip is how disruptive it was to that kind of traditional very non-transparent industry of venture capital and they came in and really shook it up. So let's have a listen to Ben Horowitz talking about exactly what they did and what happened. Like the, if you study venture capital, there is, uh, when we started, there were, I think, 800 venture capital firms. There's a lot less now. Um, but all the returns went to not only like five firms every year, but the same five firms for like 30 years. Uh, and the reason is, um, or the reason was that uh, the best entrepreneurs would only take money from the best venture capital firms. An awesome business model because it was self-perpetuating. Like as long as you were at the top, you are very likely to stay at the top. We were able to kind of crack that open by doing something that was really unconventional at the time, which is not unconventional at all anymore, which was marketing. So we were sort of the first venture capital firm to super aggressively market itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had, so we had a unique position and a very aggressive marketing idea. And that sort of opened it up to say, well, like they may have a much longer track record than us, but we will tell you exactly, exactly how we think about building a company. Like everything from like how you hire, how you conduct a layoff, like how you think about capital raising, like everything. We were going to lay it all out in great detail. And up to that point, um, the industry was just super opaque. Like you didn't know. It was all like the man behind the curtain, um, which was actually a very good strategy for the people who were winning. Mm-hmm. It was just a bad strategy for new firms, but new firms tended to just adopt what the old firms were doing. So that was the big breakthrough. Mm. Yeah. I, transparency, I think is really what helped them break through that. And kind of, as he jokingly says, you know, adding marketing to the, to the playbook and on how to succeed. But it's, it's interesting that in, in such a like defensible industry, like venture capital, uh, something as simple as being transparent with both kind of your limited partners that you're bringing on and also the founders you're investing in, how something as simple as that can actually take you from a initial $300 million fund, you know, to over a four or $5 billion fund in just a matter of a few years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we can also learn from this is when you know something, when you are an expert or an authority on something, the best thing you can do is to share the secret source. Mm. Don't hold it back. You know, you you remember pre-internet, the world was built on intellectual property, building walls, having your own thing and not sharing it. That's your your sustainable advantage. Well, now we're in an era where if you know something and you want to build authority, you do it through sharing. And, and, and by the very act of just being transparent, as you said, they created a uh, huge momentum for themselves against the establishment. And I think this really speaks to how anyone listening who is launching a new product or company should think about what can I share with the world? What do I know? How can I help people by sharing that? And frankly, Chad, I think that's kind of exactly 
what we're doing together here. We're going on a journey, we're decoding, we're learning, and we're sharing it with everyone. Yeah, I wouldn't put us uh, in the same league as uh, these innovators, <laughs> but we're doing our best yeah, to learn as much as we can from them. And like you said, not keep it to ourselves. You know, yes. I think I love, you know, the metaphors of rising tide lifts all boats and growing the pie mm. as opposed to, you know, dividing up the pie. And um, I yeah. think that that attitude of, of abundance is is becoming more and more, you know, I think it used to kind of be in the world of the new agey kumbaya set, but I think everyone's be beginning to understand that that abundance mindset is better for everyone instead of that scarcity mindset. Yes. yes. And, you know, here we have an example in A16Z, which is Andreessen Horowitz, just for our listeners, and we may refer to it either as Andreessen Horowitz or A16Z. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been really, it's been really encouraging to me to see more people opening up, sharing what they know and teaching. Yeah, I think that it really is uh, something born of the openness of the internet, which has created a, a whole shift towards sharing. Uh, you know, we've obviously seen open source and so forth, but I think it really only works if you've got a story worth telling. And I think uh, these guys, both Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, have a lot of sharp thinking around innovation, talent, building teams, and so forth. Don't you think they're, of all the people we've listened to, they've really both got some very sharp and broad thinking about business and innovation success? Yeah, and I think it's the combination of their success as founders in their companies. And then now, I think they said they see something like 2,000 pitches from companies that have been warmly introduced to them, meaning someone they know has brought that company to their attention and, you know, they're being pitched 2,000 times in a given year. Hmm. Um, so all of that exposure to different companies and what they're doing and then working with all their po portfolio teams gives them a very interesting uh, vantage point. And this next clip from Mark, he's kind of giving all of us, you know, three you know, best practices and tips for startup success. Well, so the general criteria for a successful high-tech startup, um, in my view, there's, you see different sort of rules of thumb from different people, but the, the three big things you always come back to are, is, it, is, is there a big market? And, and by the way, that comes in two parts. Is there a big existing market that you think you can go after and sort of displace incumbents? Or, is, is it, or do you believe there will be a new market that will be big? So big market. Um, is there a fundamental technology or economic change that causes you to basically justify having a new company? Um, and that's really important. Um, so, you know, and, and the way I always think about that is, is there a 10x change happening in the technology landscape? Um, is something 10x faster or 10x cheaper or 10x better? Um, and then the third is team. Is, is the team outstanding? And if you think about this as an entrepreneur, it becomes a question of the founding team. Um, you know, if, you know, some companies are solo founders and they can work, but generally, you know, most of us, like myself, who are human beings, or mortal, um, you know, you want to have a founding team of, multi, uh, of, uh, of complementary skill sets. And so you want to have at least one super strong technologist, um, quite possibly more than one. Um, and so that we sort of look at market product and team. Um, and, you know, the reality is you need all three. Um, I would say, interestingly, if you're going to compromise as an investor, if we're going to compromise on one of those, it would actually be the product. And the reason I say that is because a great market is a lot easier to make up for with iterative product execution um, than a poor market. Because the problem with a poor market, a small market, is even if you do a great job on the product, there just aren't that many customers. So what, uh, I mean, there it is. You've got a guy who's worth a couple of billion. He's invested in so many of the leading startups of our world. But there he gives it. Now, Now I'm just going into super student mode. Here for me are the essentials. Is there a market for what you're trying to do? Are you leveraging technology to do something 10 times better? And do you have the right team? Inside of this, I mean, Chad, I think we could probably do a whole show just on that formula. But very much reoccurring themes. Uh, you'll have heard me talk a lot about making things 10 times better. That's what you need to do in order to successfully launch to get traction for your company. Team, big theme of the show last year, having the right team members. I think in a particular angle on startups, have 
the co-founder. I mean, this is just essential stuff. Don't try and do it all by yourself. And I think when you when you actually sit back, what what formula he's just given us there can be applied across all companies, all products. And there's so many companies that don't succeed because they only had one or two of the three in the formula that, that Mark just gave us. Yeah, I, it's really instructive to me how, like I said, here's someone that sees thousands of startup pitches in any given year. You know, how do you even begin to identify the companies that, you know, will, will be giving you that 10x return that you need as a venture capitalist? And I think the fact that he's kind of boiled it down to these three things, I'm pretty sure that's kind of his mental model for evaluating any idea now is, yeah. is there a market? Is the product 10 times better? And is there a really solid team that's building it? And so I'm, I'm thinking in his mind, he's probably giving the, each company a thumbs up or a thumbs down in those. And if all three aren't thumbs up, then he's not going to be interested exactly. in that. Exactly. Exactly. It's also, it's very similar to what Johan was telling us in Amsam. And in fact, this formula that we just got is not necessarily different to that of the industry. The success comes in knowing how to understand market, how to understand if something's 10 times better and how to understand team. That's probably the, the great art of, of venture capital. Um, but it's how they put it into action. Now, just one note here for our listeners. If you're interested in this, I'm going to put in the show notes a link to a very important article that their firm published called 16 Things where they talk about their investment thesis and formula, just as they did in this clip. And then they attach to that their thought leadership and writing around the 16 themes, the 16 things uh, that they really like as emerging places to exploit this formula. So you can imagine VR, machine learning, security, Bitcoin, etc. That's all in there. But If you are hungry to dive into this, we have the super link in the show notes at moonshots.io because as as we said, this is such a big topic. It's full of good stuff. So if you are interested in going next level deeper, check out the, the show notes. Okay, so... Now we've gone deep into, into their formula. We've, we've seen what it takes in terms of the cerebral thinking, but we know that none of this can happen if people and talent are not in place to, to live the dream, to make it come alive, and just to put in the, the serious hard work that it takes to launch a successful company. So this next clip that we have from Mark Andreessen really exploits this idea, and it's probably a mistake that we've all made, of hiring someone who's not quite right. And this has serious implications for a company when you don't manage the hiring process and have a clear vision of what a great employee can be. So let's have a listen to Mark Andreessen talking about the law of crappy people. Um, And what the law of crappy people really is, is that the the capabilities or the competence of the people at any level in your company as you grow um, are going to degrade to the worst person at that level in your company. Um, And so your your vice presidents um, over time are all going to be as bad as your worst vice president. Um, your engineers, over time, are all going to be as bad as your worst engineer. And the reason is because the way that hiring decisions get made and the way that promotion decisions get made inside a company is within reference to the people who are already there. Um, and you basically need to just beat it back with a stick. I mean, you need to be like so determined to not have the stand, it's another term uh, that people use, the soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, you need to be absolutely determined to have your definition of good not be 
the average of the people we have in the company or the person who was accidentally promoted to a, a certain level who really shouldn't have been, but now that he is, that's the definition of, of the level because he's now part of it. And one of the heuristics I think you can use to, to, to beat it back is to ask yourself the question on every hire and on every promotion um, is are you, are you raising the average? Um, because you're probably either, if you're hiring somebody or promoting somebody, you're either going to be raising the average at that level uh, or for that role in the company or you're going to be lowering the average. Yeah, this idea of lowering the average was really fascinating to me. I, I've never worked at a company, so I haven't experienced this directly uh, from kind of the employee side. But I have kind of noticed this in choosing the people that I collaborate with and the people that I hire. But it's kind of been subconscious. And I think the way the way Mark just calls out and he's like, look, if they're not increasing the average and making you better, then you shouldn't be hiring them. Um, that mm. in an organization, there will be this tendency to kind of revert back to the average, which if everyone kind of does that, then you're just, you know, you're diluting the, the amount of talent that you have available at your disposal. Uh, look, I, I want to take you to how this moment, uh, this idea is manifest. And that is what I've seen in companies is that, you're looking for somebody, you're recruiting for a position, and you're kind of but not totally satisfied with the candidates you're talking to. But there are deadlines, you need to get the hire done, and you end up hiring someone who's not quite right, but it was easier than starting again and challenging yourself to go and find the right person. The same thing happens uh, when people, and he spoke about this, promoting people who are not ready or not right for the promotion. Mm. Both of those two moments that I just mentioned are the law of crappy people in action. So I, the learning for me on this is that when we're thinking about who we want to collaborate with, whether as employees or partners on a project, whatever, if you've got that little feeling that it's not quite right, that's the law of crappy people screaming at you saying, don't do this. But sometimes we don't listen to that inner voice, right? Yeah, sometimes the external pressures are just too great uh, for us to listen to to our, that inner voice that says, no, no, wait, wait for the right person. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. It's definitely come back to bite me before. But you know, this relates directly back to his his market product team philosophy. You know, mm -hmm. you know, that's that's the formula that he uses to look at a team. And if he sees a team that's declining in performance, then you know he knows that that's that's the the reason behind it. Yeah, and and this is particularly important when a young company moves out of survival mode gets into some traction, maybe goes from startup to scale up, you know, hey, we've got some customers, we're paying the bills, there's potential to really take this somewhere. And you move beyond that inner circle, you're beyond 10 or 15 people, you move to 20, 30, 40. This is when all the degradation can start in terms of the quality of people. I think the other interesting thing we can learn from this is to challenge yourself to always surround yourself and hire people better than yourself, which is a mm -hmm. thing that's come up before. You've got to get people that you can learn from that can challenge you. Getting someone who's clearly a B player is just making the big mistake uh, in that law of crappy people. Yeah, going, you know, A people hire B people and B people hire C people. Right. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's kind of crass, but I, I can see how it's very true. And, yeah, and, um, and, but, but I think of it like this, Chad. I think all we're saying, the, a way to translate A, B, or C is the quality of the fit. It's the judgment of that person coming into the context of this team, this company, mm -hmm, this organization. Mm -hmm. How good is the fit? Is it an A quality fit? or a B quality fit. Because the one thing I've seen is I've seen people performing at C level in one company, move to another one and light the world on fire. So we know it's about the context and the fit. Everyone's got a talent. We're just not all uh, in the right place at the right time. So I think it's, you know, you can expand this to you know, the degree of fit. And if it's not quite right, don't do it. Yeah, no, I, that's really important. I'm glad you brought that up. And it it could be that they just need to be on a different team uh, right. within the same company. 
right. um, Absolutely. under a different manager or, or managing a different group of people, et cetera. This next clip we have from Ben, and I, I love kind of going back and forth between uh, the two of them. You know, I had so much fun in our last uh, clips show. This is this is kind of a, a little bit of a continuation of that. Um, so it's, this this is definitely fun. Ben talks about the P the, or, or product from the the product market team uh, formula, and um, he just gives some good advice around how to think about you know building your first product uh, when you're just starting out as a startup. Startups get really hard uh, when the product gets into market. Mm. And those, those of you who have done it know this, right? Like when you're building the product, it's all good. You know, how's your startup? It's doing fantastic. You know, we're building the product. It's going to be great. It's so genius. Like everybody I tell about it kisses me on the lips and says, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but then you get in market and nobody wants it. Like then it gets real hard real fast. Um, so that's like kind of the first psychological trauma. Um, but the, 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 the initial skill is, can you build a great product? Can you build a product that um, you know, a lot of people really want uh, for whatever reason? And that is different um, than kind of building a great company. And, uh, but if you can't build a great product, it doesn't matter if you can build a great company because you, you don't belong in a startup because if you can't build a great product, you never get to the great company. And that was actually a big uh, error in the 90s. Um, and a lot of the lean startup methodology and so forth came out of the mistakes that were made in the 90s where they'd bring in a professional CEO really early on who didn't know how to build a great product and would you know, build the company to a giant size and burn up all the cash. Uh, product, product, product. It's so true, Chad. I got to tell you, like, get the product right. And there's so many distractions uh, that, that Horowitz is alluding to. Fancy business cards, uh, snazzy uh, trappings of a proper company, uh, the reality of innovation. And we're learning this from not just Silicon Valley. Branson had a chalkboard saying, you know, flights for 25 mm -hmm. bucks, right? You have to get a product right. And I think that the, the temptation is to be distracted by all the obvious things around a company, but not the essential things of product. And to me, for, for what this reminds me of and reinforces to me is it's product first. And I think when we talk about a product in this context, it deserves a little bit of uh, focus. And, and what we're talking about is a product, a physical product, or a digital service, or anything in between, something that you have built. And the key thing is that you have tested, you have validated it with real customers. The big opportunity when we talk about product is not like we built something. It's that we have built something and we have tested, we have learned from real customers. And we know, we're not guessing anymore, we know they Love yeah. it. This is what we mean by product. Yeah, th there's an interesting other part of this interview where Ben is talking about, it, it's kind of right before here, it, you can spend 18 months and, and, and all of my money as the VC, you know, building this great quote unquote, you know, product that actually hasn't seen the light of day. And then this quote picks up where he says, you know, actually, when you put it in the market, that's when it gets hard. Because when it's in the market, it's being tested it with dozens or hundreds or thousands or even millions of customers. And that's kind of where the metal and the value uh, and the success of your company is going to, to be determined is when it, you know, it hits the ground and, and people actually start, start using it. Mm. It's, it's so true. So this is the big shift he was alluding to that Lean has created, which is moving away from guessing that a product's going to be good to knowing, to really knowing that it's going to be good. And if you can do that, then you are on the path to success. And I think for our listeners, this is the big, big takeout is make sure that you are testing and learning your idea that you're not guessing. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing folks can take away from this. Yeah, I, I think also to not be distracted by the VC money or the pressure to hire a shiny new CEO because all of those things will distract you from 
building the product. He, he, he said you can't have a product or you can't have a company without a great product first. So if you set out to bring in the right management and, and, and C-suite and let the product die in the vine, like you're just, you're not going to have a company and you're going to spend all the money. Yeah, it's really, really true. So already in this show, let's just think about what we've, we've covered. We've seen how um, Andreessen Horowitz totally disrupted the VC market by by thinking about having been customers of the VCs, what the perfect VC firm would look like. They've brought their thinking from being inside to outside and made it much more transparent. They've they've got great thing. This essential formula for success, you know, market ten x uh, in technology and a great team, and that all of this uh, starts with building a great product first and you need good people to get that done and you need to watch out for that law of <laughs> the law uh-huh. of crappy people and just watch out for that big nasty thing and going uh, into markets that have lots of opportunity yes and there is a nuance there it's actually good that you bring that up because there's a nuance there because he said mark says it's not just about a market that you see mm-hmm. there may be a market that is yet to emerge and if you if you think about it, things in that sense, there seems like a world of possibilities in front of us. Um, so that's what we've got already, and we're only halfway through. The second half of the show, we are going to go through four amazing clips that really speak to entrepreneurship, and it, you'll see the signature style of, of uh, Ben Horowitz in particular exposing what it really takes to be successful, and I think that's what's going to be so valuable for our audience. But before we do, Mike, I think I would like to ask you, because I haven't read Ben's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. So why don't you uh, share kind of maybe some of the biggest learnings that you took from reading it? Yeah. So I think the, the reason this book matters, it's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. We'll have a link to it in the show, in the show notes is I think it's so nice for uh, uh, he, Ben Horowitz and Mark, they're, they're poster boys of <clears throat> Silicon Valley and startups. Yet what is so good about Ben Horowitz's book is he deliberately tells you how hard it really is. It's, a, if you will, a warts and all story where he starts from the point of here are the really nasty, hard, stressful things that happen all the time that nobody mm. talks about. And I found it in both ways, it was refreshing and it made you more aware of what you're getting into. But on the other side, it's also like, well, once you explore the most stressful things and you get almost forensic about them, this book gives you a lot of suggestions on how you can tackle things that in most cases kill companies and how you can actually get through them and and become stronger when you're through on Mm -hmm. the other end yeah i think what's been surprising to me is kind of is ben's uh candor and vulnerability in the interviews that i've watched with him and i think both he and mark and the entire company are genuinely interested in being very open and transparent about the real lives of startups and the real, you know, consequences of doing the hard work to create these companies. Yeah, yeah. I, it's it's really a distinct tone of voice that they have, which is transparency and, and openness. And, and you, you get it in full color in, in the book. So it's called The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. If you just go to moonshots.io, you'll be able to get the link to that. And, and really, it's a big recommendation from myself this time, uh, my first little Moonshots yeah. book review, Chad. Um, and I, I think that sets us up beautifully. So why don't we, why don't you, Chad, help us launch into a new series of clips all about entrepreneurship? We've got two great short clips and two longer clips. And when I heard this next quote from Ben in the interview, I immediately thought of Richard Branson. And so I'm just going to play this clip and see if you, the listeners, can figure out why. The basis of a good company is to basically figure out something about the world that nobody else knows, and then that, that secret becomes the company. 
Mike? Yeah, the secret, huh? The secret. How does it relate to uh, to Branson? I guess that's my question to you. See if you can pick up what I what I Oh, up. I'm going to let you tell us. I think you've got something here that uh, you've got much <laughs> better than I do. So you, why don't you why don't you break this open? Because I only have some music. Well, it's really it's actually quite it's quite simple. I the simplicity of how Richard Branson comes up with ideas for companies of turn your frustrations into businesses. That genius mm. I heard in Ben's quote of take the secrets of the world and turn those into businesses. So, you know, for those of us that are looking for ways to see the world in a new way to come up with ideas of our own, now we have another, you know, tool in our toolkit uh, to be able to do that. So, mm. you know, uh, we can journal our frustrations and, you know, or even just uh, carry around a chalkboard with us and uh, and create businesses out of our frustrations like Richard Branson. Uh, <laughs> but now we can, you know, mm. try and uncover, discover secrets in the world uh, and turn those into businesses as well. That That's why I love this, this clip so much. Yeah. And, and I, I think we all know that feeling when a secret becomes a company and when you really have a founder telling you the story and you're like oh my gosh you, you it's a thrill it's a sort of a rush that you get and you're like oh, they know the secret they've captured the lightning in a bottle and it's it's so so true um because the secret bit and this is what i learned from that and this was kind of where i was going the secret is related to the fact that if it was obvious and not a secret, then everyone would already mm -hmm. be been doing it. So it speaks a little bit to the timing that you've decoded a secret way of doing something and the secret infers that nobody knows about it. So when Uber came out, when if you look at the explosion of Bitcoin and uh, blockchain technology, there are secret ways of doing things differently and when you do it, Amazing things happen, but yeah. the secret bit, it's also about the timing, doing it in a completely different way when nobody else is thinking about doing that. And that's why often you will hear Ben Horowitz talking about that when the best ideas and the best companies are often explained when they're very early stage, a lot of people write them off and don't understand it because they're using a secret that people don't get people don't understand it because it's a secret. And they're like, huh? Oh, that's never going to work. And, you know, famously we heard Chris Sucker in the last show and we've heard Andreessen Horowitz in clips, not that we're going to have on the show, but if you have a look, they all admit to just not understanding ideas that have turned out to be really big. So Andreessen Horowitz, they invested in Airbnb, but mm -hmm. in our previous show, Chris Sucker didn't invest in it because he didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Remember, he said sleeping on the couch, it doesn't make any sense to me. In the same way, Andreessen Horowitz didn't understand Square, which even though they invested in Twitter, which Jack Dorsey did both companies, they didn't get Square. And they, and they openly admit to be kicking themselves that they didn't do it. But that's what the, the secret speaks to. Yeah, I, th I think the, the timing part is very important. Mark Andreessen in, in another interview brings up the Apple Newton as, you know, 15, mm. 17 years ahead of its time as a, as a kind of a palm, you it know, was. tablet uh, form factor computing device. So Apple, Apple's known that secret of, you know, the future of, of smartphones and tablets, you know, for many years but came out too early. Yes, you are absolutely right. They were too early. And let's go even one step deeper. And this is really important for our listeners. Apple created a handheld product called the Apple Newton, which in form factor looks like uh, you can easily see the first iPhone in it, can't you, which came 15 years later. But why did the iPhone work and the Apple Newton fail? If you can draw the line between them and say that, you know, the, the Newton was the predecessor, you know, here's the thing. They didn't test and learn enough, and that's why it was too early, because the Apple Newton was competing with a handwritten pen, paper note 
So you pull out your notepad and you just scroll down an idea, Richard Branson style. However, the problem was in the lab, the e-ink uh, writing technology kind of worked, but once they shipped it in a mass market, hugely scaled product, it simply, the Apple Newton handheld recognition technology could not compete anywhere close to pen and paper. And that's why it mm. failed big time. All the other thinking and vision around the experience was perfect. But because they didn't get out there and truly test the product, this is exactly what we were talking about around building great product first. And great means you've test and learn. That was the big learning that we can make is just because it's working good in PowerPoint or in a prototype software and in Vision, until you know you can do it in the field, in real life, until you know you can do that, you do not have a great product. Yeah, and it the whole rest of the industry just kind of wrote off that entire product, you know, potential. And then oh, Apple just sat yes. on it and then they saw all of you know, the increase in cell data access and cloud computing and all of, in touch screens and, you know, high res displays, and then reintroduced it with all of that as kind of a multiplying factor. And then, you know, we don't have to tell everyone how successful the iPhone is. <laughs> yeah. So take that idea, Chad, and, and, and just think about that you really need to have a great tested and validated product and underlying that idea of you found a secret way of doing things. When it goes wrong, you're no longer in, in a peaceful, tranquil world. Mm. It's a time of war. And what's really interesting about Ben Horowitz is he talks about all the management philosophies that are out there in the world are all for the peacetime CEO, uh, good weather situations. In Holland, they, they have this great saying of lekker via mensen, which means good weather people. They only do well in good times and they don't really do well in bad. Well, Ben Horowitz, he actually is a big advocate of being able to work in wartime because that's what it's really like. That's what we've seen in his book and that's what we've seen in his transparency. So let's have a listen now to what Ben has to say around peacetime versus wartime CEOs. If you read the, in, in the management literature, it's almost entirely written for peacetime CEOs. So like... Everything you learn about decision making, you know, and, and delegation and don't micromanage and all these things are very peacetime oriented in the sense that in peacetime, you're much more focused on the development of the people and the development of the organization um, over the long term and the ability for the organization outside of yourself to make higher quality decisions. And, uh, and then also um, kind of be creative outside of the mission uh, and that's kind of all affordable if like you've got say um, you know like you've got Google search and you're just like running steamrolling through the industry then you, you can do a lot more kind of peacetime sort of things um, on the other hand right if you're running out of cash or if you're like Apple when Steve Jobs first took over and they had three weeks of cash left and so forth like you can't actually, like that's not affordable in the decision making process. Um, you've got to get to the, a very accurate decision extremely quickly. Um, and that's when you kind of have like a, that's when the wartime techniques come into play. And you know, sometimes in wartime, you end up doing things that actually do undermine the development of the organization because the, there's more burden on the CEO to make a much larger number of decisions because accuracy is so important. And the CEO, by virtue of uh, her position, has got more knowledge to make those decisions uh, and, and more authority, too, to make them definitive and fast and qu high quality. I would love to soak up all of the wartime CEO strategies that, that Mark and Ben and their firm have he only kind of hints at it here, but uh, the distinction he makes, I think, is an important one because he kind of frames it in that, you know, peacetime CEOs can focus on building up the company, but wartime CEOs may have to make tough and difficult decisions that that impact uh, the business maybe in a negative way, you know, to be able to just kind of like you know, to fight mm -hmm. that fight and kind of put out the fires that they're dealing with. 
Mm. Yeah, because uh, a theme that we've seen, and we're going to do, uh, and we have to do a show on Paul Graham from Y Combinator. He talks about survival is success. And where I'm going with that is in wartime, sometimes you have to do things that don't really serve, you know, the vision and the strategy, but they mm. serve survival, right? We exist, we can keep going because particularly decisions with cash flow, which are often deeply neglected. I mean, I've seen this so many times, like manage the cash. You might have a great product, great people, but manage the cash for goodness sake. And this is what happens in wartime when things are challenging. You have to make calls where you forego your, maybe your vision uh, in, in, in a sort of a content uh, mm. approach and just say, no, we need to survive. So we need to cut this, do this, pivot this. And what's really powerful that we can learn from Ben Horowitz is, is it's wartime much more than you think. Mm -hmm. Yet most of the literature and inputs are all about peacetime. So go looking for learnings about when it's hard, when it's tough, when you don't know what to do, when there's incredible constraints put on you. And I think that being open to this and knowing that this is going to come is critical for anyone thinking of being a founder or a CEO. Here's the thing. It is not easy. Don't romanticize it. Don't, don't envision yourself driving a Tesla th through Silicon Valley. It's hard. You sacrifice more than you can ever imagine. And it's only through that sacrifice that, that you succeed because if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. You would have millions of competitors. So you know when you hit hard things, you're actually the strangest thing in the world is you're actually on track when it gets hard. Because that means you're encountering meaningful challenge constraint that most people fail on. So that's why you've got to lean in to, to the wartime and, and, and go in search of solutions at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Yeah, I think the funniest part of that part of the interview was when he's talking about, you know, so I was I started my company and I read, started reading the literature, and it's like, here are all the things that you can do, you know, to keep things from going wrong. And he's like, well, but I, you know, mess things up in the first week. So now what do I do? I can't read any of these management <laughs> books because they're telling me how to prevent things from going wrong, but it's gone all wrong. <laughs> oh, it's so true. It's so true. And, you know, there's an interesting uh, thought that, that Mark Andreessen has, which is when we're in this situation, we go looking, uh, we, we look high to the skies uh, for magic to fall into our hands or we look for what he calls the silver bullets, mm. right? And the reality is that life is very different to that. Entrepreneurship, innovation is very different to that. So let's have a listen now to Mark Andreessen talking not about silver bullets but lead bullets. One of our beliefs that Ben also talks about in his book is there's, there's no silver bullet. Like there's the temptation when you get kind of in, in the shit is always like there's got to be a way out of this and it's got to be one thing. Like there's got to be some idea or to your point, some piece of advice, right, or some way to reframe, you know, if I could just reframe the pitch this way or if I could just hire this person or just get this customer um, or something, you know, it's going to fix everything. And we, we always like to say there are no silver bullets, there are only lead bullets. Um, and so you just have to kind of do all the work. Um, and most of the work is just a grinding, it's just, you know, grinding labor and there's just no substitute for it. Yeah, this resonated with me so much. I think when I'm in the middle of that grind, part of me is tempted to go and search for that silver bullet. You know, I think, oh, there's, there's, there is that one thing that I can do that will make all of my insert problem here cash flow hiring <laughs> you know, it's just like it'll make it so much better but um it's good to hear from someone like mark that's like nope it's just a lot of grinding and hard work yeah and and i think that uh it's such an important message now because it's never been easier to start a company um, but it doesn't make success come any easier so starting is very different to really succeeding to build building a thriving growing business that has momentum and i know that uh, that for some of our listeners you might be like well the you know chad and mike are getting rather stoic 
uh, in this part of the show, you know. But it's true. The obstacle is the way. Hardship is the way with entrepreneurship because it is more than just building a great product. It's building a great team. It's building a great business model. It's building a great story that customers can adopt and advocate and share with the world. To me, though, this is why I love what we talk about, what we do in our jobs, why I love it so much, the desire to create something 10 times better because it's so hard. And this this is so challenging. It's almost impossible. I mean, you know, uh, Clay Christensen, one of the gurus of innovation, says that 95% of innovation projects fail. And it's so true of not only products, it's the same same numbers for companies. Very few succeed. And this makes it infinitely interesting and compelling to me because it's so hard. So it's a lifetime of work is needed to succeed in this space. To me, that's what uh, Mark and Ben are, are highlighting for us in these clips. Yeah, I, I think my takeaway from from the lead bullets is just to continue to chip away at your most important work. And that's where the breakthroughs will come from. If you set out to make a big breakthrough, it that's not really how <laughs> innovation happens. It's it, it's in the weeds. It's doing the work. And I think, especially for us solo entrepreneurs out there, we can really get stuck in our own heads trying to find the solution. And um, it's it's all part of our collective, you know, I don't want to say suffering, maybe a struggle, mm. to, you know, to, to, to persevere and to build the, the products and the companies that, that we want to. And I would love to end this show with a clip from Ben Horowitz, really just kind of elaborating on that and a little bit of real talk around, you know, our journey as entrepreneurs and how it's not, uh, it's not always a rosy uh, road for us. And, um, so here he is talking about the entrepreneurial struggle. You've brought all these people in. They believed in you. Um, things aren't going as sold. Uh, and, you know, like you feel that. And, and it's going badly. And then, like, it's amplified if they read that you suck in the press, uh, as they did about me many times. It's like, Ben's an idiot. It's like, oh, God. You know, and it wasn't that. I, like, I didn't care that they said I was an idiot. What bothered me was, People who work for me would go home and their spouse would go, you know, your CEO is an idiot. Like I just read it here in Business Week. You know, you just have to focus your mind on like what you can do, not what you can't do. And you can't focus on like what's going on wrong and what that might imply. And, you know, Peter Thiel has a great thing in his startup kind of class that he taught, which is he says, look, there's people who believe in statistics. And they believe that, like, there's, you know, probabilities of things happen and all you can do is run a process and, like, it is what it is and the statistics come out. And then there's people who believe in calculus. And they believe there's a right answer. And if you're a startup CEO, you have to believe in calculus. You have to believe you can find the answer and that's all you can focus on. And there's an answer out there somewhere. And trust me, like, there's always an answer. And hopefully, you know, God willing, you have enough time to get to the answer. Um, but that's really all there is. I don't think there's not that much comfort out there. Like I talk to entrepreneurs all the time. I try and tell, let me tell you how bad it was for me. It sucked. And they're like, that was then, motherfucker. <laughs> this is now. This is my company. I don't care about you. <laughs> and so, hmm. yeah, I, I love how he he can tell the story of um, people that worked for him would go home and say, look at how bad your CEO is. He's in being totally trashed in Business Week. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's so good that he talks about that and puts it in perspective because I do not know of any wildly successful company that has not experienced some great valleys of darkness. So it's not just for those that fail. It's actually those that succeed as well. Look mm -hmm. at what Uber's been going through the last year. They were a poster boy and now they're in big trouble. You know, it's for sure it's part of the journey and, and I, I just find it um, reassuring that when we face hardship, we know that, hey, these guys who are absolutely pioneers and leaders, they had it too. I mean, it's 
deeply reassuring, isn't it, Chad? Yeah, I think hearing from two very experienced, not only startup founders, but also venture capital investors is just a nice, refreshing, and very experienced perspective um, that we haven't gotten in many of the other innovators that we've decoded here on the show. Mm. I, I I think that um, the what they serve so well, both Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz, is this full spectrum of thinking. I think what has made them unique in this show is – You know, they talk about the law of crappy people. So, of course, you want to hire good people. But I love the fact that Mark's like, no, 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 this is what happens when when you hire B people. They hire C people. And those C people, they hire D people. And you're like, oh, yeah. And the way in which they call out the classic mistakes and they talk about the hard things, the challenges, and I think that this is what, I've got out of uh, digging into their content again, digging into their ideas again. It's really, it's sort of, it makes you, gives you fortitude, <laughs> I think is a good way of describing their thinking. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, I, I love the clip, you know, going and finding secrets and turning those into businesses and also just learning f- from them how important they see things like transparency to be, which, you know, again, we're, we're, we're seeing more and more going back to Uber, you know, now that we, the public know what was actually going on, you know, we can make better informed decisions about what we want companies to be held accountable for. Mm, mm. Let me ask you this question, Chad, if you were to do one thing differently after taking on all this, uh, uh, slightly stoic thinking from Andreessen and Horowitz, What's the one thing you will do differently tomorrow based on what you've heard today? That's a tough question. But um, I think... Did it, was it the hardship um, uh, stuff, uh, the wartime stuff from Ben Horowitz that, that sparked your mind? Or is it, it sounds like the secret uh, becoming a company was really compelling for you. Are you maybe going to go and look for the secret that you have or the, look for a secret that you can apply to storytelling? Yeah, exactly. I think that that's what I was trying to say a little earlier is that, you know, now I have this toolkit of looking for frustrations in my own life and, and uncovering secrets and then maybe mm. y- use that new perspective to, you know, create new product lines or services, you know, in, in, in what I'm doing. Mm. Mm. Just look, looking yeah. at, at, at the world in a maybe slightly different or new way. Mm. I, I think um, I'm more, uh, if you've got the finding the secrets, I'm, I love the wartime thinking. I love this, the, this, this reinforcement for us in the, in the audience. Build a great product first and do the hard work of validating and testing that and make sure that you really have something and do the hard yards and build a great team before you get too carried away. And, and I think it's such a great reminder, particularly for a new year, that we're starting a new year and I think it's so important to recognize and to be ready to climb the mountain and it's a big mountain indeed, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's so many other great uh, figures in the VC world that we could talk about, but I would actually you know, like to maybe choose a different area or kind of go back to our, uh, to the other side of things and, and, you know, find a a Silicon Valley or or tech startup to, to profile in our next episode. Do you have any, uh, anything on the, on the radar, Mike, we we can always come back and do Paul Graham and Peter Thiel um, another time, but I'm kind of itching to get back into the, into the nitty gritty of a company. Okay. So are you feeling more entrepreneurial or more product design-y in terms of the themes that you'd like to dig into? I I feel like that's a leading question because I I know where you're going with it, but I I love that. (laughs) I I would love diving into the design-y side of things because I know we have some good uh, potential subjects lined up there. Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, what jumps to my mind, what jumps to my mind is... Two people, 
Brian Chesky, the design founder of Airbnb, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Airbnb, any of the Airbnb guys, is, I mean, hold them in great regard in terms of their, their product. And um, I would also say a classic, you know, other than Joe and Brian at Airbnb, particularly Joe actually, now that I think about it, the other person has to be Johnny Ive, right? Mm-hmm. Either of those two for the next show. I mean, we could start a whole new chapter of a couple of design gurus. I would even go as far as Dyson uh, from the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, I hold all those three guys with tremendous regard, tremendous regard. Cool. Well, I'm excited to, uh, I I, I mean, if you guys... The listeners could see our list. It's, you know, dozens of, of people. <laughs> like we'll be, Mike and I will be doing this for, for many months. For a lifetime and beyond. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, I want to give a shout out to all of you listeners and just say thank you. Mike and I had a fantastic time last year doing all of the, the research and, and, and discussions uh, and recordings, uh, you know, to hopefully... Uh, give us and you the tools you know, to go out and do some really great work. And, um, you know, we're committed to doing that for you and for ourselves in this new year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I wanted to say, Chad, just a big thank you, not only for the whole year last year, but I just feel we've got so many good things ahead of us this year for the show. I'm, I'm really excited about jumping uh, into the world of design. It's very close to my heart. So I'm super excited about that. I think um, we did uh, ourselves and the audience a great service today in unlocking the thinking of Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen. So much to learn there. And I, I do think Ben's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, is a must read for anyone wishing to start a company. So I feel that at this point, we've we've got a great road ahead of us. So thank you to you, Chad, to our listeners. And we can't wait uh, for the next show where we jump into the world of design here on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>